Good morning. Good morning to all of you and welcome to another edition of the First Nations Housing Webinar Series. Uh, this is a whole series of where we've gathered people together to answer questions that the First Nation leadership has been asking. And so we've collected a lot of people on a lot of topics to come together. You can see a replay of this uh, right away tomorrow on uh, the First Nations Housing Conference website. Uh, so and there, actually, if you look at chat, there's a hot link uh, there to get you to that. Uh, today, uh, during the webinar, we'll hold the questions and we'll have about a half an hour of presentation. And then after that, we'll get into the questions and answers. If we don't get to round to answering your question, we will collect them all and send them on to Scott so you'll get an answer. Uh, so you might want to just keep your eye on the chat. That's where you should be asking your questions. You can ask your question at any time, but we won't uh, open that up until after Scott is finished. Now, Scott Christie is a gentleman who is an inspector uh, for housing, and uh, he's going to tell us about the, uh, let me get this title right, the Environmental Public Health Services Housing Program. Scott, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a long time you've been working with the program. Uh, yeah, about 10 years. Um, yes. I've been working with uh, Indigenous Services Canada about five years. And previously, I was working with the province in northern British Columbia for another five. Okay. Well, tell me, why do you feel that we need to talk about this? Is the program poorly known or poorly understood? Um, um, I, th I think it's always good to get more awareness, just what your, you know, your local health inspector, environmental public health officer uh, can offer in terms of just like education, resources, and when when needed and when it's necessary, inspections as well. Okay. Well, I'm not going to waste any more time. We'll get right to the topic and uh, I'll get out of the way and then I'll be back at the end of the presentation. We'll deal with your questions and answers. Right. Scott, take it away. All right. Let me just share my screen. Well, one thing while he's sharing the screen, I forgot to mention, there is the First Nations Housing Conference coming up February 4, 5, 6 in Thunder Bay. And uh, you might want to uh, look at the possibility of joining us there. We're doing some very interesting things this year. So, Scott, you got your presentation up. Let's go. All right. Everyone can see it all right? Yep. All right. Excellent. It. So, yes. Yeah, so well, uh, thank you all for coming to my presentation. Uh, Helping Healthy Homes Happen. Um, I'm a big fan of the letter H. Um, but yeah, it's all about what our role is in health officers in terms of housing. You know. But my name is Scott Christie. I'm an environmental public health officer. Um, I'm based out of Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is the traditional lands of the Fort William First Nations, signatory to the Robin Superior Treaty of 1850. And I work for the Environmental Public Health Services of the First Nation in your health branch of Indigenous Services Canada. Uh, formerly Health Canada. A bit of a mouthful, but here we go. So what the whole objective of our program is, is we work to identify and prevent environmental public health risks that could negatively impact the health of First Nations community residents. And we recommend corrective actions to reduce these risks. So EPHOs, or Environmental Public Health Officers, formerly known as environmental health officers. Um, they, they kept getting us mixed up with environmental officers, which is a, a different thing altogether, but we provide advice and guidance and education and public health inspections, importantly, to First Nations to help manage those public health risks associated with the environment. We also gather and analyze data to promote public health in First Nation communities. Uh, we can be employed by Indigenous Services Canada, the First, Inu First Nations and Inuit Health Branch, or other First Nations organizations. And importantly, we're all certified with the Canadian Institute of Public Health Inspectors. So we have a number of you know, things that are core programming, but today we're going to focus on health and housing, although really everything's connected when it comes to health. So what our job is when it comes to health and housing, for the most part, we do housing inspections. So you know, at the request of chief and council, um, it's typically not done as part of routine, uh, we'll do inspections to evaluate indoor air quality, contaminants, pest control, water supply, solid and liquid waste disposal, general safety, structural defects, and overcrowding. Um, we're a bit of a, a jack of all trades master of none. 
Uh, we can even review plans when they're in the planning stage and provide a public health perspective. We also even provide advice and guidance, chief and counsel, on all stages of housing, siting and design, construction, and even demolition. We also do the occasional public education, well, like we're, what we're doing right now, and even provide training upon request to specific issues related to housing. So today's topics I'll be covering about indoor air quality, pests, drinking water, sewage, food safety, and a bit of fire safety even. So on our first topic, we'll talk about mold. Uh, mold and radon, I would say, is probably one of the biggest requests that we're getting right now. So I'm gonna focus a little bit more on those. So what is mold? So mold is a common word for any kind of fungus that just grows on food or damp materials. It could be black or white, often looks like a stain or smudge, and you can even be smell a bit musty. I'm sure we've all seen it on our windowsills and our bathrooms, right? But importantly, it releases spores into the air, which then you inhale because they're small enough to get, make it past your lungs. And then that can negatively impact your health if it's inhaled enough in high enough concentrations. But for an order to mold to happen, you need about relative humidity, about 50 to 70% or higher. Uh, moisture, usually that comes from some sort of leaks or condensation, maybe from flooding, time. The material itself has to be wet for 48 hours. And of course, the material itself, a food source. So dust, drywall, cardboard, cellulose, wood, really anything mold can grow on. So why are we worried about mold? Well, because simply there's a relationship between indoor mold and all these you know, the symptoms, eye and nose and throat irritation, coughing and phlegm buildup, wheeze, wheezing and shortness of breath, asthma, allergic reactions. Now, people, different people respond to mold in different ways. It all depends on the amount of exposure and the person's overall health, say if they have any other pre-existing conditions. For example, two people could enter the same house, one be affected and the other one just fine. So what is our role? Well, the main thing we do is a visual inspection. I know it's not very scientific, but I assure you we're very good around looking at our flashlights, but don't be afraid to poke around your own house too with a flashlight as well. Uh, the main thing is like, yeah, we look for sources of moisture, we look for mold. You can do sampling, but overall, it's not really going to change the outcome. If you find mold, the recommendation is the same, no matter what kind of mold it is, you're still going to want to stop the source of moisture and clean it up. And if the materials are badly damaged enough, replace those. So yeah, what to do, just remove the moisture source and clean up the mold. That's the best way to reduce the health risk. So before you clean up any mold, you should take a few steps just to not create any more accidental exposures. You know, when you're moving things around, cleaning it up, that's gonna release some more spores. We do recommend some basic personal protective equipment, generally an N95 mask or better if it's bad enough. Uh, some safety glasses or goggles and some rubber gloves as a precaution during the cleanup. Any children or elderly or people such as uh, asthma or allergies should probably leave the house, but you know, when in doubt, consult with your physician. So for small areas, generally, as long as you have appropriate PPE, they're safe to clean up by yourself. So any areas that are less than the size of a standard large garbage bag, fold in half, so one square meter. So again, put on your PPE and just a bucket of water with some dish detergent is perfectly fine. You don't need to use anything fancy. Um, wipe it down with the soapy water, but quickly dry afterwards. That's the key thing here. And again, if any materials are badly damaged enough, such as ceiling tiles, upholstery, carpeting, well, you'll want to get rid of that or replace it. Uh, medium areas, so that's to say between one square meter and three square meter, um, you know, you can combine that in patches. But uh, in some, most of those cases, you'll probably start to need professional help. Um, but the cleaning, again, can probably be safely done with proper training precautions. Anything over three meters squared, well, it's probably best to look to the contractors. So some typical areas that are high risk of moth gold, uh, vents, roofs, dryer disconnects, bathtub seals, disconnected exhausts, uh, windows particularly, especially if it's the, the house itself is kept cold or it has a high amount of humidity, uh, water leaks underneath sinks, uh, plugged and clogged vents such as in the bathroom, the dryer, or your HRV. So 
What's the best way to prevent mold? Control the moisture and control the humidity. So obviously that means checking and stocking for leaks, say in your home foundation, your walls, your windows. Uh, ventilation is a great way to control the humidity. So using exhaust fans, checking your clothes dryers and bathroom and kitchen fans, make sure they're vented properly the outside and the vents are connected. Ensure that your vents aren't blocked, especially, well, this time of year when snow starts happening. And make sure, oh, and then I would like to mention, you know, say if you don't have a lot of room in your, uh, in your house and uh, your furniture ends up blocking some of those vents, well, you can buy, as that picture in the lower right, these vent extenders. Um, very handy feature, amazing modern world we live in. Um, but one thing I would love to emphasize, turn on and use your HRV. That's going to go a long way into well, not only saving you money, but reduce the amount of humidity that you have in your house. All right, another thing, again, it's all about controlling that moisture and controlling the humidity, reducing that clutter and removing sources of moisture, especially in the crawl space, throwing away any wet and damaged items. Firewood itself can often be a source of mold. And you know, if you're unlucky enough to have carpet in your bathroom or basement, you know, probably a good time to get rid of it as any, right? Ideally, stopping water from entering the foundation is also good. And directing any water away from your house to the eaves, downspout expansions. And I mean, this is when the house is first being designed, but having your ground sloped away from the home foundation. All right, on to radon. So what is radon? It's a naturally occurring radioactive gas. It's colorless, tater, tasteless, and odorless. Basically, you can't see it, you can't smell it, and you can't taste it. Um, it's produced naturally from the decay of uranium that's present in soil and rocks in small amount. In Canada, it's measured in becquerels, but in the US, it's measured in picocuries. So, radon is released from the soil as it naturally decays. Radon gas naturally or easily moves through permeable soils much more easily. Radon also can be released to the water as well. Generally, when you're walking around outside, it's never a concern just because it's diluted by so much fresh air, so it never gets to be a big enough concentration. But when you have a home or a basin, that's when it starts to get concentrated. So how does it get into your house in the first place? Well, any kind of cracks or openings or gaps in your foundation, basically wherever the soil is exposed to the inside of your house. Typically, the inside of your house is a lower pressure than the outside, so that's where it draws the air in creating a vacuum. But yes, once inside, it can build up to dangerous levels. Uh, what other factors affect it? Well, I mean, a whole bunch of things, really. The amount of uranium in the ground, the weather, the soil type, you know, the foundation of your house, the number of openings there are, the heating, the ventilation, and just even are you spending a lot of time down in that basement or down in that crawl space? So why are we worried about radon? Well, it's the known leading cause of lung cancer. In Ontario, for example, 13.6% of lung cancer deaths are due to radon exposure, roughly 850 deaths per year. It's only really beaten out by smoking as the main cause of lung cancer. I would also add that smoking and radon combined together, well, then you have a increased one in the three chance of getting lung cancer versus if you just had a high radon, it's a one in 20 chance. So back in 2007, there was a new guideline introduced about 200 becquerels in the normal occupancy area. So, you know, any, any kind of place, you know, dwellings, residential homes, schools, hospitals, and if you're there for more than four hours per day. So, I mean, really, if, if, if it's a crawl space or, you know, a, a sump pump pit, no, you don't have to worry about that unless you're spending four hours a day or more down there. Really the only way to find out if you have it is to test for it. You can either hire a certified professional or just purchase a kit and do it yourself. Honestly, they're not too pricey, um, but it does take time. Generally we recommend using it for a longer period of time, at least a minimum of three months, ideally during the fall and winter months. Um, but even a year, if you can do it for a year, that's even better. These are some of the common Test devices, the electric ion chamber, and the alpha track detector, those are the most common and cheapest ones. So once you've sent that, you know, done your test for three months or at least a year, and you sent that off to the lab and send you back, and they have something like, oh, you know, 300 becquerels or something like that in your, in a, in, in your closet downstairs, right? And you're like, okay, well, 
you should probably ideally get that fixed within two years. Again, assuming you're spending well, four hours a day or more down there. Um, if it's above 600 Becquerel as well, we recommend that you get that fixed even sooner. So how can you reduce radon levels? Well, there are certified radon mit mitigation professionals. Uh, one of the most effective ways is the active soil depressurization. A little bit more on that later. Other things you can do is really just increase the, increase the rate of air exchange. So usually some kind of air exchanger, even just a fan or the HRV unit and sealing cracks in the foundation, uh, the sump holes or gaps around pipes or drains, that's highly effective as well. But the active soil depressurization, essentially you're installing a, an area of uh, low pressure into the soil that's you know, underneath the foundation of your house. And that's going to suck all that radon air and just vent it onto the outside. Um, a little bit costly to install, but not, not very costly to run as you're just paying for the cost of a fan to run. So there was a survey done in 2009 to 2011 about radon, approximately 1,400 homes across Canada, or 14,000, and about 95% of all health regions had homes that tested above the Canadian guideline of 200 becquerels. That's to say, there's no radon-free areas, you know, just because your neighbors don't have it doesn't mean you don't have it, right? Um, and approximately about 7% of Canadian homes exceeded that guideline. Um, in 2010, there were some major changes to the National Building Code for protection against radon ingress, including a polyethylene soil gas barrier underneath any slab, a slab primer sealed to the air barrier of the wall, and all penetration so piping uh, should be sealed, as well as sump pit covers should be airtight. So how can we help? If the community, you know, the First Nations we observe, expresses interest in surveying their housing, we can help with their planning, testing, sampling approach, and provide guidance on the proper deployment of detectors. Basically, you want it where they're not going to be disturbed and where it accurately reflects, you know, a person's use of their home. And then from there, based on the laboratory results, we can recommend some courses of action. All right, now briefly on to carbon monoxide as the weather is getting colder. So carbon monoxide, what is it? It's an odorless, tasteless, colorless gas and really only detectable by carbon monoxide alarm. Why do I bring it up? It's very dangerous. It can cause a coma or even death at very high levels. Lower levels, it's not as bad, but it can still cause dizziness, headaches, tiredness, shortness of breath, a whole bunch of other symptoms. One of the first things I always ask people if I'm doing housing inspection and I notice they have some sort of fuel burning appliance in there, typically like a wood stove. Uh, so do you get seasonal symptoms? Do you happen to get headaches every time around Christmas and not just because of the family. Mm -hmm. But really anything, any kind of combustion can cause carbon monoxide. Cars, trucks, ATVs, motorcycles, any fuel burning appliances, furnaces, generators, lawnmowers, snow blowers. The best way to you know, avoid symptoms and exposure is well, having a CO detector. And really, not just in your house, really anywhere you would run equipment in enclosed space. So this could be even something like a workshop or a shed or garage. Uh, ventilation is very important. Fresh air, dilute it, vent on out the carbon monoxide. Make sure your vents aren't, vents aren't blocked by snow or debris. And certainly make sure they're cleaned as needed. Inspecting all your fuel burning appliances as well is important. You know, there's wet inspections for any kind of wood stoves. Uh, but certainly you're looking for leaks, cracks, broken or torn tubes or pipes. And again, if, you're, if you think you suffer from you know, carbon monoxide poisoning, certainly we can always come in. We have air detecting units to measure the count of carbon monoxide in real time. All right, on to pests. Another unfortunate thing that affects the health of our homes. So bed bugs. What are bed bugs? Oval, flat, wingless insects, about six, meter, six millimeters long. Not very big, They're about reddish brown in color. They turn a bit deep red after feeding on us. And well, that's why we hate them, because they feed on us. Uh, they can't fly or jump. They can only crawl slowly. Um, some other things, they do bite, um, but they are not bed bugs, but they're just as annoying, like book lice or fleas. Uh, bed bugs in general don't wander very far from their food source. They'll feed at night. They're attracted to the carbon dioxide in their breath. They particularly like to feed on pets, especially because um, they don't complain as much. And they like dark places 
to hide. They also are been very known, unfortunately, to hitchhike on luggage, furniture, donated bedding, things like that. The problem is that, you know, once you start getting bitten by them, you may not even like think much of it. You know, they're usually painless. Um, they're just, they're small and they're visible, but generally they'll heal just fine. Most people don't really have any reaction. Some might have an allergic reaction, but generally not. Um, and it can look like just a regular spider or mosquito bite. So it's kind of difficult to say that you have bed bugs just from the bites alone. Um, what's the best way to find them? Well, just seeing them, seeing them on your furniture. Now, certainly if you do find a bug and you think it's a bed bug or you're just not even sure, take a picture or bottle it up or put it in a Ziploc bag and mail it on to us. We're happy to identify it for you. Um, Another telltale sign is dark spots visible on the bedding or furniture of their droppings. Blood stains also from just you know, crushing the bed bugs on your sheets. And sometimes they might leave a sweet, musty kind of odor. Signs of infestations, where to look? Well, I mean, they're very small. They're very wily. They can hide just about anywhere. Generally, though, they're going to stay where there's people at night. So couches and beds, that's your best bet for finding them. Um, here, yeah, seams of a mattress. Mm, someone's close up on just some blankets. And then in some extreme cases, underneath beds on the bed frame itself. My apologies. I hope we've had breakfast before this. All right, what to do? Well, unfortunately, they can be very difficult to get rid of. Usually you're going to need repeated treatments. Uh, the best ways, if, if you have a lot of them, is just to hire a licensed pest control operator. They'll be able to confirm that you have bed bugs, find out where they're hiding, and treat the home and belongings with either kind of st steam, heat, or chemicals as necessary. And likely you're going to need repeated treatments, and you'll have to follow directions in terms of just you know, quarantining your items and treating your items. Some of the best ways, of course, is just prevention, you know. Don't bring, don't use secondhand mattresses or box springs or other upholstered furniture into your hold. If you are going to bring, you know, used furniture, be sure to inspect it very thoroughly. I also like to point out that winter is nature's pesticide. They're, they can't stand the very cold. So if it gets to negative 20, yeah, leave your stuff outside. I mean, if you can stand the cold um, for a week and that will kill off any bed bugs as well. Um, and can secondhand clothing, the one who laundered that in hot water, and dry it on the hottest cycle. Around 50 degrees Celsius is effective at killing bed bugs and bed bug eggs. Um, particularly when you come back from traveling, put your stuff in the garage or in your bathtub just while you're unpacking as they have trouble crawling on slippery surfaces. And minimizing your clutter always helps as well just so you can spot them there. So some strategies for housing departments, communication and prevention is your best key, is your best bet. So, you know, via community websites, newspapers, community letters, social media, providing resources and information, fact sheets, which we can also provide you as well. Um, and yeah, messages, especially this time of year, about how to look for bed bugs when you're traveling and you stay at a hotel. So if you suspect you have a bed bug problem, try to capture one, contact your community environmental public health officer. Um, ideally, you want to have a bit of an integrated approach with other kinds of social departments. The family itself may just need some help as well, because cooperation, particularly to make the treatment effective, is important. I'm not going to get into all the ways you can deal with bed bugs, but seem, these are some of the big ones. Using mattress protectors, because they love to hide in mattresses. Uh, monitoring traps around homes, just sticky, sticky glue paper traps. Uh, interceptors on the legs of uh, beds, which you can see in the lower right there. Again, they have trouble climbing up those slippery surfaces. Or even just as a last ditch effort, if you just smear some Vaseline or petroleum jelly around your around the legs of a bed, that can work as well. All right. Are they harmful to humans? Physically, no. I mean, they're more of a nuisance, not particularly a health hazard. At least there's no evidence yet that they don't transmit any kind of you know, bloodborne infections. Um, certainly, you could get infections from just scratching. You know, and certainly, any bite should be treated by a healthcare professional. Um, you could also get an allergic reaction. But that all being said, really, you know, if you've ever lived through bed bugs, you know, it, it causes you lots of stress and anxiety, insomnia, and social isolation, and that's going to have just as great a health impact as anything else could. Really, 
All right, now we'll talk briefly about cockroaches and mice. I've combined them together mainly just because, well, dealing with them is kind of the same thing, but for just in contrast with bed bugs, they can unfortunately transmit diseases. Salmonella, antivirus, E. coli, typhus, lots of bad things. And again, prevention is the best method, looking for signs of them and getting on top of it when they're still, it's still just a small problem. What are some common prevention, prevention methods and solutions to infestations? Well, regular cleaning, decluttering, monitoring with, you know, for looking for signs of them and with sticky traps, preventing entry in the first place if you can see up those cracks. And again, if it's serious enough, well, seek a professional exterminator. Of course, we'll always call away and we're happy to give some guidance and advice. All right, now I'm going to briefly cover about drinking water. Now, this whole topic could be uh, you know, a few hour presentation by itself, but I'm just going to hit some main points. So if you have your own on-site, well, we do recommend regular bacteriological testing from accredited laboratories. Typically off the home shelf kits are like, eh, they're very prone to errors and false positives. We would also recommend if it's never been done, the occasional chemical testing, that's say checking for levels of metals in there and whatnot. Um, if you do happen to get a, you know, a a positive result you know, from your bacteriological test, well, you can always shock it with bleach. That is to say, you put some bleach in your well, I know, shocking, um, make sure it's unscented bleach, but you let it dwell in there, that will kill off any bacteria, but be sure to flush it on out before you start using it again. If it's not a deep well, um, then we certainly recommend some kind of treatment. Um, one question I always ask people that have wells is, does your water change at all? You know, does it change color or taste or odor, um, especially with the seasons? Um, if it does, that's, that's a sign that your well isn't quite deep enough and you need treatment. Water should not be, um, yeah, water, water should not be anything crazy. It should be boring and predictable. Uh, we also recommend regular inspections. We have more resources on that later. Um, overall though, in, individual household wells are not regulated in Ontario, but still certainly, and so, them, but certainly feel free to reach on out for advice or information. If it was, say, a well-attached, say, school or nursing station, we certainly would inspect that, though. And cisterns. I know many people are on cisterns, especially in the northern flying communities, so I thought appropriate to include that. So ideally, you should be filled from a safe source. You know, that's to say your local water treatment plant. Um, and they should also have, if you want, you know, information on the regular chemical and metal testing that's done. Um, we still do also recommend a regular bacteriological testing, ideally quarterly to yearly. Um, we also recommend a yearly cleaning, shocking disinfection, more instructions on that, but similar to the, what, how you do it for a well. Um, and again, it's not typically inspected, uh, at least for individual households. Um, but again, feel free to reach on out. All right, sewage. So septic systems. Um, so yeah, on-site septic systems, it's something that's used to safely dispose of your sewage that your household produces into the ground. Um, but why are we concerned? Why are we getting involved in it? Because a malfunctioning sewage system can as easily cause sewage spills and sewage backups. Um, and sewage itself can transmit diseases, parasites, viruses. Sewer gas can also just be a nuisance as well, causing headaches or even respiratory issues if it gets significant enough. So what are some common reasons for a malfunctioning septic system? Well, the system itself could just be failing, could be old. Um, the fuel itself, unfortunately, this is what happens all the time, can get crushed or compacted. Um, any kind of machinery or vehicles or even a quad or an ATV should be kept off the disposal field. Lots of septic systems lifespan have been cut short because of this. Could also be blockages. I know they say, oh, septic system. No, no, no baby wipe. No, no, none of those cleaners are flushable. They all clog on up the system. Really, um, you know, look at the graphic below. The only thing that really goes, should, is able to go into a septic system is, you know, toilet paper and human waste. Um, I would also point, point out, it's always a good reminder that the septic system itself can be a bit of a physical hazard. Make sure to keep that lid closed and locked if possible, especially if you have kids or pets. So if your septic system is failing, again, contact your housing department or your environmental public health officer. 
Um, some standard recommendations for malfunctions, we're pretty much always going to say, well, have it pumped on out first, and then you can kind of see what you're dealing with. Uh, you can also do some leak tests just using some dye, particularly if there's any discharges. But keep in mind your average disposal field lifespan is 20 to 30 years before it needs to be replaced, and it may just be its time. All right, holding tanks. What is a holding tank? Kind of similar to a septic system, but no treatment, no field. It's just a big container for your sewage. Um, again, kind of it can be a physical hazard. Really keep it locked at all times, especially buried tanks. Um, do not enter them because they can have very low oxygen levels. Treat it as a hazardous confined space. All right. Now we're going to get a bit into which I think is a, an often an overlooked aspect of housing. Um, and that's just the design of the kitchen. I like to cook. I spent way too many hours in the kitchen cooking for my kids. Sometimes they're grateful, sometimes they're not. But at the very least, I like to know what makes a good faucet. <laughs> so one thing often I, I see in a lot of homes are these tiny, tiny countertops. And if you simply just don't have enough space to separate your dirty and your clean work, then that itself can be a source of contamination. Foodborne illness is still unfortunately very common among Canadians. Uh, generally, pretty much every Canadian usually gets at least one foodborne illness through a year. Cross-contamination is a very common way to get foodborne illness. Um, and if your house is anything like mine, counter space is at a premium. Um, it's constantly occupied by my kids' toys or my wife's laptop. Another thing I'd like to point out is sinks. The sink on the lower left is kind of what I grew up with. I always had was assigned to do the dishes and I hated that sink because it was never deep enough. The faucet was so low that you always had trouble rinsing things off and I, it just made dishwashing unpleasant. Um, so I've emphasized that with the big no. What we want is something more on the right. Deeper, a nice movable faucet, even a little space on the side to have your drying rack. Oh, it's, it's a much better consumer experience. And not to mention just safer, really, from a food safety perspective. But I know the, the one big sink is the, the trendy thing to do now, but a double sink, I think, is still best. So you can have that two compartment dishwashing. Um, but yes, ideally, you want it large enough to be able to submerge most pots and pans. All right, faucets themselves. Well, you know, you want to make hand washing easy. Every time you make it hard, well, that's just another chance you're not going to wash your hands. And not only to prevent you know, transmission of communicable diseases, really just for hygiene in general, they can wash in easy. So something on the lower left where uh, you have to turn each faucet and to get the water going, I mean, uh, that just takes a long time. And plus you're contaminating the faucet itself as you turn on with your dirty hands. But something on the lower right, you know, one handle, you can just knock it on open with your elbow and boom, there you go. Or if you can prevent contamination in the first place, there's even faucets now that can be used with a foot pedal, which you can see in the upper right, or even somewhere you can even just touch it and that activates it as well. All right, now for my last topic, I'll talk a bit about fire safety. Um, it's not particularly my area of expertise, but with the holidays coming on up, I figure it's a good time for a few PSAs as any. So, some holiday consideration. Candles. My kids love candles. <sighs> really kind of any open flame, essential oil burners, sparklers, incense, uh, little votives, whatever. Um, and, and, and if your kids are anything like mine, we want to inspire that kind of curiosity. Unfortunately, you know, we have to take a hard line when it comes to candles. As soon as we turn our back, as soon as I turn my back, they start poking with all sorts of things, seeing what can burn and what can't, right? And then they get that wonderful glee look in their eye like that little girl in the upper right. Um, yeah, so candles is definitely definitely one. Keep, keep, keep them away from anything flammable. Keep them in ideally proper candle holder and don't leave them unattended. Christmas trees. Now, they're typically not flammable when they're still green in the first cut, but as the, as the weeks go on and on and on, they can get uh, a lot drier, and especially the pine needles themselves can start to become quite flammable. Ideally, keep them watered, and well, as soon as Christmas is done, think about you know, turning to firewood sooner rather than later. Uh, Christmas lights themselves, 
though the LED technology is prevalent and cheaper now, they still do pose a bit of a fire risk. You can check on this web, uh, website for any recalls, um, a little bit more on that later. And I'd also say, if your kids are anything like mine, they seem to find the only puddle in the whole schoolyard and just come home with soaking wet clothes every day. Um, but one thing I'd like to remind people is not to hang clothes too close to furnaces or radiators, particularly if they're synthetics, which catch fire much easier than natural fires. So for example, the website I was just mentioning, yeah, here's a recall from the previous year, a uh, one for yeah, fire hazard. So we're we about ready to wrap up here, Chris Scott. Yeah, yeah, I have two more slides left. Okay. Yeah. All right, so some basic fire safety solutions. Yeah, don't leave flames unattended. Um, if you're worried about your Christmas lights at all, you can turn them off before you leave, or perhaps even consider alternatives like LED candles. And of course, I'd say test your smoke alarm. Don't ignore the don't ignore those chirps when the battery is going. All right, some resources and references for you later on. Yes, any questions? And that's me up there inspecting the um, oh yes the uh, the healing lodge, uh, the youth healing lodge up in Cat Lake, the crawl space. We were looking around for mold and signs of pests. So yes, it's all part of our job. Especially in a healing lodge, you'd want that to stay safe and sound and healthy, yeah? Indeed. So you mentioned often to contact uh, the uh, environmental, uh, to contact your group, the Environmental Public Health Service Housing Program. How do you do that? You mentioned that sometimes you work with individuals, but usually you work with chief and counsel or through agencies in the community. What's, yeah. What, yeah. How does that work? Yeah, yeah. So typically we'll get a request, usually from the housing department manager or from chief and counsel, um, usually in response to some sort of complaint. Be like, oh, the, the roof is broken or we have a significant amount of mold or pests or something like that. Um, sometimes the issue, if it's certainly severe enough, you know, we can also do by distance just for a quicker response, particularly if it's a remote community and you have to take a flight to get on up there or something like that. Um, but otherwise, yeah, yeah, we're just a we're, we're a phone call away. Again, depends where you are, right? um, and certainly there are some that are you know at least in Ontario um, are done through the tribal councils, like for example, like Matawa or Nokiwin or if not. So, an individual in the community should they reach out to you directly, or should they go to some organization within their community who will reach out to you? Uh, uh, either or is fine. You know, we're, we're always, you know, if an individual reaches out, we're certainly we'll, we'll contact the housing department on their behalf too. We're fine uh, doing that. Um, of course, we have to get permission from chief and council to do the housing inspection itself. Um, okay, but you can do the coordinating and make sure that goes, because I'm just looking at the frustration of bureaucracy. <laughs> no, I, 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 I completely understand. Uh, it's, it's, it's never fun when you seem to get bounced around. But yes, yes, if, if an individual reaches out to us, we're happy to reach out to the housing department on their behalf and hopefully try to arrange an inspection. But again, we, we do need permission uh, to do the inspection in the first place from the housing department. And what does the community leader do? They reach out to you directly to talk about programs or how to, how to get more support. For instance, you were talking about uh, listing things on the website. Uh, that uh, would be good tips to teach about the health. Can you provide that material to the community to or help them with developing that material? Yeah, yeah, uh, we certainly yeah, we've done that in the past and always happy to do so. It's uh, it's it's part of the uh, you know the the better part of my job. I like to think if we can all turn ourselves into uh, inspectors, um, then I won't have to do so much work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't seem to have much coming in on the chat. Uh, if you have a question, uh, oh, we just got one. I spoke too fast. Is there a way to test for airborne mold, which could affect indoor air quality? You talked a little bit about testing. Yeah, yeah. So there does exist air sampling, right? Um, I would very much caution against that because it can be very misleading. The best way still is just doing visual inspection um, and yeah, and certainly we'd rec we'd recommend looking in places that you, you know you, you wouldn't normally see during the day, especially if you're not seeing anything around your home. So things like your attic and your crawl space. 
Um, because yeah, eh, with air sampling, you know, it, it's just, you have too many, um, it's too prone to error. And then you're like, oh, you get a result that isn't as bad. You're like, oh, I guess I don't have it. No, that's not true. It could just be, there wasn't particularly a lot of air activity that picked up the spores that day. I've actually found that sometimes the problem is that normal air has a lot of mold and, and uh, microbes and things in it that are not harmful to us, but they show up in an air test and then everybody panics and says, look at this list of what I've got. And if you go outside, you get the same list. It's, <laughs> it's not even necessarily the house. So it is a real hard thing to evaluate and properly judge uh, where that is. And you mentioned that sometimes it's different in different parts of the house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That needs to be looked at as well. Yeah. Uh, question, how often should homes undergo inspections and what should homeowners expect during an APHS inspection? Yeah, in terms of just, I guess, the frequency of like how often the home should be inspected, um, well, typically we leave that up to the First Nations Housing Department, you know, kind of what, what they want to set as their priority and how often they want to inspect for what things. Every community is a bit different um, and certainly the designs of their homes can be different as well. Um, but certainly if the housing department say they need more support or they want, uh, they want inspections to help, say, secure some funding or something like that, we're happy to come on in and do, help them do inspections um, in terms of what they should expect. I suppose a, a, a lot of respectful questions and a lot of respectful flashlight and camera taking use. Certainly, we, we always ask for permission first before taking any pictures or whatnot. But yeah, it's just lots of poking and prodding. But I would suspect an inspection in this case is often driven by the health consequences. Mm -hmm. People are not well. Is, mm -hmm. is it the house is the question. Or did we just catch a cold or is the house making us sick? And we've got to do something about that. Another question from Scott Knight. Does EPHS provide the radon test kits or does the nation have to purchase them? And does EPHS have a supplier that sells them at a reduced cost? Yeah, I believe at this moment, um, we only do regular radon testing in say like um, in, uh, public buildings. So things like, oh, like schools and daycares and like band offices. Uh, for individual homes, you have to contact your First Nations to purchase them. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a line on supplier. All right. Well, lung associations in every province do sell the pucks, mm -hmm. and the pucks are not very expensive, and they're actually quite reliable. You let them sit for at least three months and uh, send them to a lab, and you get a report back. And it's an averaged over time report, which is important. Mm -hmm. You just have to be careful to mark the date you started the date you finished so they know how long the time is <laughs> to get their average um okay if there's more questions that come in we'll send them on to you scott but uh i thank you very much for this presentation and uh let's see what do we have that we have to touch on here um the recorded files are going to be available as of probably tomorrow the first nations housing conference.com slash webinars landing and uh, that'll get you to where you can get a copy of this um, there will be a survey that shows up at the end before you check out and we would appreciate your filling in the survey to get us more information and we need your feedback on this and other presentations so we know what you want this whole series is developed around your questions so if you have something that you really want to get more details on and you don't have the direct contact to the people you need, let us know and we'll see if we can't work out one a webinar sometime or another that deals specifically with that. Scott, I appreciate this. I'm glad to see your kids are getting older from the picture that I saw earlier. Um, but um, thank you very much and thank everybody for uh, listening. I hope that this has helped and clarified some of the health issues, but also spotlighted for you a resource that you can do it. Um, I'm getting a lot of thank yous and Meshwich and a uh, great presentation. So you're getting good feedback here from lots of different people. So thank you, Scott.